So I've had the uh, good fortune of going back and forth, forth across the country working with different equine and agricultural companies and trying to find answers to their waste management questions and, and issues and problems. And probably, as Jamie said, uh, one of the realizations that comes up is one of the least expensive options that you have is to compost your material. But then what do you do? You know, here you've got this, this mountain material that is now a, a, a beautiful and useful material, but what are you going to do with it? Okay, I'm trying to turn my slide here. Can we do, can someone do this man? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, it will start by talking about uses for compost on site. And one of the most exciting, I think, innovations of the last, oh, even year or two has been the idea of using bedding reuse at equine facilities. It's a long-standing accepted practice for many dairy facilities and really quite new to the equine. And it was really kind of an unintended consequence of some research that we were doing on uh, our compost material that we were creating out of an in-vessel system. So I'm going to cover a little bit more about that in a minute. But when you look around your farm, you know, do you bring in landscape material now? Uh, do you have to fertilize your fields? Do you have areas from construction that have lost their topsoil and need to be resurfaced? Do you have areas where you need erosion control? If you have arenas, you can look at uh, footing, whether it's indoor or outdoor. So really, when you, you look around your own facility, I think you'll be surprised that you will have certainly more than one option for using compost on site. Trying to get to the next slide again. So there are certainly some very uh, strong advantages of bedding use. And the first one being that you will lower your bedding costs by 4%. And you are going to do a, you know, a mix of your material back into the stall with new shavings. Uh, we did this, this trial with shavings, so I have not done it with straw. It's going to be more difficult, I believe, because uh, you will not have the integrity of the straw remaining through your composting process. You will eliminate your disposal costs, and even just looking at those two financial numbers, it's going to be pretty significant for any facility anyway that I worked with. But this unintended consequence that we had was finding that there were actually health benefits. The savings on health care came from anything from foot health, uh, common thrush issues, to leg health, uh, scratches, which plagues many of the show barns, uh, skin health, dermatitis and hives, the respiratory health, uh, heaves, and other allergen-driven problems for the horses. And we did find a reduction of flies or parasite larvae. A woman that I know from State University did her PhD work on bedding reuse with composted material and believes that there's a probiotic effect that actually takes place. And, you know, the compost killing the pathogens and the parasites, but has a thriving um, like population of its own that will compete aggressively with the fungal and bacterial pathogens that are responsible for the effects on the horses. I observed that actually firsthand because when I was doing my trials, I had a, a retired jumper that had contracted scratches which is, a, a, for those who don't know, quite a nasty skin irritation that is kind of an oozing sore that just is very, very difficult to get rid of. And within about two weeks, 10 days to two weeks on compost and bedding, uh, it significantly decreased. 
a veterinarian that worked on Caitlin Price Youngquist. Oh, my slide's not advancing, I'm sorry. Um, there we go. I was working with her on her PhD project. I uh, was very impressed because she had a horse that she had to give a tracheotomy to. And they were very concerned because the, you know, breathing was still very labored. There was a lot of, of um, what was presenting itself really as an allergy reaction to just the dust from the stalls. And when they put that horse on the reuse setting, it dramatically did itself. Next slide. And we also did some testing on the absorption capabilities, which lines up really with everything that you've heard already today. Um, the compost has broken down and stuff that it actually offers a greater absorption than the green shavings. So other uses on site, we'll talk a little bit about arena. Next slide, please. Uh, arena footing. So indoors, you know, you could use it completely on its own. Uh, I would recommend, again, mixing it with uh, another material because on its own, it really is going to become quite dusty. Uh, even if you watered it down, I don't believe it's going to have the base that you need for good traction, you know, underneath a nice cushioned layer of, of compost. So as much as it's nice soft footing for your horse, I think on its own, it, it does need to be work with another material just to increase the lifespan. Next slide. So the outdoor footing uh, is really, I think, almost more exciting because so many people like to have nice grass uh, jumping fields. And what you're going to find by adding compost, and, and the site that I worked with, they added three inches uh, a year. They did it twice a year, between three and four inches. And they found that the increased root growth was substantial. It offered tremendous cushion. It held moisture so they did not have to water the field as often as they had before. And it offered better drainage. So I come from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we tend to get our fair share of rain. And these fields that was how the compost works, and it's, it's been almost three years now, just continues to show a greater ability to absorb the moisture and also flush it throughout the, the grass area so that they didn't have wet areas that occurred. Next slide. So also in this barn that I ended up working with, it, it was a, an old gravel pit, and as you can imagine, it was it was torn up terribly, and they wanted to have pastures surrounding the barn area, which was kind of in the center of the property, and they started spreading their compost, and it created beautiful pasture. Again, in you know, helped with any erosion on the hills, helped with the quality of the grass that was being grown, did just everything that they wanted in creating their their lovely space. They also used it for landscaping, as does uh, one of the largest show facilities in the country. And that's kind of an interesting story as well. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the thermal showgrounds in California where they have you know, 2,000 horses a week for, well, I believe it's 10 weeks now. And obviously had a tremendous amount of material to be hauled off and, <laughs> and exposed up somewhere until they started doing composting on site. And they found that they were able to build all of this beautiful landscaping around the arenas with their compost material. Next slide. So if you are still either unable to find uses for your compost on site, or you're curious at looking into really what financial value your compost would hold uh, out in retail, retail or wholesale market. There is more and more information really comes to light to help guide you. And looking in your own area uh, is really crucial to figure out, you know, what some of these possibilities are. And just a few to think about is, you know, sale is a soil amendment. Whether you, you have farmers next door that need some of the nutrients on their pastures, 
um, whether you have a food composting site nearby. Uh, equine stable waste actually is, is one of the best feedstock, you know, additives that need to go in with, with food waste composting. If you have a soil specialty company, they are trying to find large quantities of homogenous product, such as the compost that you'd be creating to mix in with their different soils. Land reclamation, whether it's landfills that are being covered, gravel pits that are being resurfaced, uh, Department of Transportation is also a, a wonderful resource for what different projects are going to compost. And when you think about looking along the sides of your highways where they try to keep, uh, you know, planted areas that have little water use or water needs, the compost there has been very, very successful. Next slide. So another thought for you would be to travel around to your local feed stores, nurseries, and get an idea of who's bagging the compost in your area. And you'll be surprised. There are distribution centers scattered throughout the United States who are looking for material to mix in with their different compost types. Next slide. One of the first things you need to do then is do some testing, and Jamie again alluded to that, and it is a, a cheap and extremely important step that you need to take, whether you're using the compost on site or off. There are different uh, soil testing companies around the country. Their prices range from what I found anywhere between $25 to $60, and it's going to uh, measure not only your nutrients, but also uh, fecal coliform or salmonella to make sure that you are getting your temperatures, that you are creating a safe product. And, you know, educating yourself, too, as to what the biological makeup is, how that's going to affect or alter the soils that you want to use it in. Certainly learn something about the water retention, you know, what the porosity of your, your material is, and certainly what the nutrients are. And from that, you can start thinking about you know, representing your product in a certain way. Next slide. The geographic market variation can be, you know, quite significant. So it is very important that you understand the needs of your area and try to match your product with what in your, your locale uh, is going to best use this product. And one thing that is, you know, interesting to look at right off the, uh, right at the start of this is the density in the area. Are you in a, a rural area that has the high density of animals or are you close to an urban area where you have the high density of people? And the market, if you look it up for, you know, what egg compost is in the United States, it's really, it, it is, it's mind boggling the amount of material that's sold. Next slide. So in your wholesale market then, what is apparent in several areas? And I can tell you it's in Florida, uh, Massachusetts, Washington State. Uh, just to give a few examples, is the idea of a collection yard. And it's equine facilities that are getting together and realizing that they have a better chance of reaping the highest value for their material and getting together and starting a collection yard. And the reason being is a lot of the whole wholesale buyers are only going to buy in 10,000 yard minimum. They want a homogenous quality product and they're going to buy it at a, on a contract sale. You know, it might be a lower price, but it's going to be a guaranteed sale. So you know you've got that money in the bank. And these yards can afford to have a little higher technology to process the material. Next slide, please. One of the projects that I've been working on is actually using sure. equine stable waste as a peat moss replacement. And I am working with the um, Department of Agriculture in Maryland to test 
stable waste that we are running through the vessel system. And so far, all the test results are very favorable that this will be a successful market. When you're looking around your area, you know, greenhouse growers are, it, it is a booming business in the United States right now. And the material that they're using, the traditional peat is a global source, which the EPA is shutting in this country, and it's forcing location of peat moss from Canada. And you can imagine the increased cost with the increased miles for bringing that product down to the greenhouse growers. Next slide. So successful market, marketing really for the wholesale market is going to depend on these four things. Quantity, you've got to get enough to create that 10,000 um, or quantity for them to buy on any specific contract. Uh, the quality, you're going to have to make sure that you have a system that's high tech enough. You don't have any clears. You meet your temperatures. It allows you to create a consistent, homogenous product, and that you're within a, usually 50 miles is your guideline. Be within 50 miles, or it can be a distribution center, then the shipping is going to work out in your financials. Next slide. So here's the crux of the matter as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> and one that, that people often overlook. They get excited about, you know, hearing what they can do and how they can get rid of their manure. And they need to spend enough time on your financial analysis to know that you're going to be successful in the long run. How are you that you're adding to the product worth the technology? You can work out quite simply your return on investment or your break-even, uh, your levelized cost being gain over lifespan of technology versus the cost of purchasing and operating the technology. Next slide. So anyone can compost, and they can compost successfully. And if you only have a couple animals, then Jamie did a great job of showing you options that you can uh, use on your farm if you're more interested in, you know, bringing higher value to it or perhaps creating higher uh, returns by increasing the volume that you're going to be running through, then you can start looking at the, the benefits of technology. And really what they bring to it is the mixing, the aeration, moisture addition, all being part of the system. It is not that you have to uh, do anything other than load these systems and unload the systems. Uh, there's temperature control through these, you know, through adding more mixing, less mixing, more aeration, less aeration, and the same with moisture. The retention time of these high-tech systems is what is it's very important because it gives you a higher turn rate. So when you start dealing with a large volume of material, and you don't have the ability for it to be processed quickly, you're talking about adding acres to your site. When you have an in-vessel system that can run through a large quantity in 14 days versus it being a couple of months, you are obviously allowing yourself to have a smaller footprint. The other interesting thing, too, about these uh, much quicker retention times is that you actually can process it successfully, you know, get successfully compost the biological material while still uh, preserving the integrity of the shavings. And the reason you would want to do that is if you are doing bedding reuse. And with the bedding reuse, I did forget to mention that you can either screen and only reuse the shavings, or you can use the entirety of the product. Health-wise, you know, either one is fine. Sometimes when you're dealing with a high-end clientele, they don't really want to see all of the uh, compost used, they're, they're a little bit more receptive of just seeing the shavings being reused. Next slide. So the scale of your operation is really going to point you towards which vessel you use. The chart that was shown is a great uh, tool to use, and this is a, a rule of thumb as well. The in-vessel systems can be quite small or treat up to three tons per day. Um, the aerated static pile systems 
can be built proportionately to anything over one ton a day. Next slide. So the parameters you're going to consider is the volume, the cost of the system, whether you are in a suburban or urban location where odor control, vector control is extremely important, your leachate control, you know, the in-vessel offers absolutely the most control over odor, vector, and leachate. The other systems, as long as they're built in concrete, can certainly uh, do the same. Uh, permitting is very interesting because permitting, again, in-vessel systems are extremely easy to permit. They are mobile. Um, you just need electrical hookup. You do need to go through a much longer process when you're talking about an ASP system. Processing time is a very important part of your business plan. That was the churn rate I'm talking about. Your product quality, the idea that you, you cannot have any outliers, you know, and what I mean by that is edges of your piles that are not getting, they're not hitting the same temperatures, they're not getting the moisture necessarily, they're not getting the aeration. So calculating your area required can be done. Uh, Jamie again had, had figures on that for you. Uh, must have your stormwater management. Again, you know, you look at the investment system and there's just no escaping of the water. So being aware of really what is, is mandating, you know, different actions on your part, uh, make sure that's early in your process and your decision making. And I do like to highlight in red the neighbor's idea because Looking at an in-vessel system doesn't really bother the neighbors. Looking at big piles of material can if that's not what they, uh, they are expecting in their neighborhood. Education is obviously paramount in getting acceptance, whether it's neighbors or clients. They do a really good job of letting people know how safe and good for the environment this you know, composting of this material really is. Next slide. So a couple differences in product quality here. In-vessel exits the system as a homogenous product. It's already had all of its mixing done, and you have greater control over the composting recipe just because it is enclosed and you have all of the, um, the systems in there that I had mentioned. An ASP system, when it exits, does need screening, and there is just a greater challenge. You don't have the complete control that you do over the in-vessel system. It just means you have to be careful watching how the system is working. Next slide. Your churn rate, uh, any of these systems are so much faster than just putting your, your material in a pile and, and churning it occasionally with a bucket loader. Um, In-vessel systems, I've even seen it as short as 10 days, uh, so 10 to 21 days for active processing. It can be used when it comes out as long as um, it is cured. You can do testing for that. I have seen it come out of those vessels and be able to be used within two weeks. Uh, the ability to get the material then off the yard more quickly, you know, means money in your pocket. The ASP system is going to process in 28 days, and this is as long as you have done the mixing and you have an aeration system. Your curing time a little bit longer, and you are going to need more space. Next slide. So the mixing, in my uh, you know my belief is that it, it really makes a difference, and especially with horse manure, those horse manure balls can come through so many composting systems intact, and no one is going to want to see that if they're buying a quality product. So find a way to break those down. Um, the auger systems are, are excellent. Um, I have really not seen too many other ways of getting those balls broken out before the composting system. And that really releases the biological process so much more quickly. That, that is what um, speeds up the, the time, why they can run it through, you know, the retention time is as quick as it is. Next slide. This is just an example of a, a compost test. Uh, easy to do and absolutely, uh, you know, must be a part of your operation. Next slide. So the persistent herbicides. Jamie touched on that. 
it is something to be very aware of. There are areas in the country where it is non-existent, and there's areas in the country where it's a real problem. What you need to do is you source your hay, whether it's through your feed store or you're buying it directly from the farmer. You need to ask them point blank. You leverage your buying power. Uh, you know, tell them that if that's the herbicide they're using, you're going to source your hay elsewhere. You can, if you're unsure or you want to be absolutely sure that your compost does not contain the persistent herbicides, you can do a very simple um, grow test. You know, pick some seeds of a, a leafy vegetable and put them in a little Dixie cup and see if you can grow it or not. You need to stay educated. This is a huge topic nationwide. Uh, there's sites you can go to that are going to tell you what the latest tests are or areas where your besides been, um, I don't know, I think outlawed is probably too strong of a, a word, but uh, suggested to not, you know, be in use. And if you stay connected to your uh, local conservation districts, they can certainly help you. And just, you know, just be aware. Know what you're doing. Be able to represent your product with confidence that you do not have a persistent herbicide as a problem as part of your compost. Next slide. So there are certainly success stories in selling the or on-site use of the compost. Fields Ranch, Bainbridge Island, Washington. This gentleman thought he was going to do bedding reuse until he realized that he buys his shavings for $7.50 a yard and he's selling his compost for anywhere between $20 and $40 a yard. If he's selling at retail, he sells it for 40. If he sells it wholesale to local landscapers, uh, he sells it to them for 20. They're selling it for as high as $65 a yard. It's very successful on the island. Uh, people who have it on their, you know, at their homes for their landscaping swear by it. It is weed f seed free, so they don't have weeds growing up through it. They feel that they're able to water less during the summer months and that plants are thriving in it. Days End Farm Horse Rescue is a site in Maryland. For them, they have an in-vessel system as well. They're doing bedding reuse. And uh, this is a project that has been jointly funded by uh, Department of Agriculture in Maryland. So I will say, I, I should have mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the financials, but there is money available to help you do this. And the best thing for you to do is to contact your local conservation district, contact uh, any government agency that you feel in your state, EPA, you know, anyone who is going to be interested in hearing that you're helping to keep the water clean and the soil healthy. And there is potential for, for grant money, um, you know, to help you install your system. Next slide. So this is what I like to show everybody. There, there is value in your manure pile. It is going to take some work. I know that many facilities uh, don't feel they have the bandwidth, but I think that once they understand there is value to be had out there, it will become just part of normal operations. 